Okay, so I am recording. Um, let me pull up the PowerPoint. Okay. So what is geoengineering? Based on maybe things that you've heard in the news or that you've looked ahead and read, can someone give me their understanding of, or like a, a definition of, or even just what they think geoengineering is referring to? We've talked about it a little bit, but anyone who wants to volunteer, you could just unmute yourself. Um, I always thought of it as um, ways like engineering ways to like help save the environment, but I don't know if that's right. Yeah, kind of. Um, that yes, I mean holistically yes, but when you say save the environment, what exactly are we referring to? There is a very specific. When we're talking about it, it's going to be a really specific kind of targeted thing like way in which we're saving the environment like uh, trying to alter the radiation budget exactly like alter those percentages exactly good yeah 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 so we talked briefly about that last week so it's it's a it's a way of, of engineering the environment right to save the environment or more specifically to halt global warming climate change okay so specifically we are trying to change around the radiation budget so that climate change isn't happening as at as quickly of a rate. So here is a neat and tidy little definition. Geoengineering is the deliberate large scale intervention in Earth's natural systems to counteract climate change specifically. So uh, this is a broad definition, it's quite broad. It encompasses, I think, a lot of um, potential outcomes. But what it is not is it's not totally analogous with like sustainability. It's not about adaptation to climate change. And it's not about necessarily like um, mitigation to climate change, right? So it's not about reducing carbon emissions or increasing fuel efficiency standards or building greener buildings or or green rooftops or any of that geoengineering specifically is changing earth's systems to specifically counteract the radiation imbalance that is causing climate change okay <clears throat> so why are we even talking about geoengineering so we've talked about this We've done a lot of work in the beginning of this course talking about climate change and all that, but specifically, it is likely that global warming will exceed 2 degrees C this century unless global greenhouse gas emissions are cut by at least 50% of 1990 levels by 2050 and by more thereafter. There is no credible emission scenario currently under which global mean temperature would peak and then decline by 2100. And unless future efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions are much more successful than they have been so far, additional action may be required so it becomes necessary, should it become necessary to cool the earth this century, right? Such action might involve geoengineering defined as the deliberate large scale intervention in the earth's climate system in order to moderate global warming. This is the definition or the justification that's given by people like David Keith and others. So what they're basically saying is climate change, there's already too much warming built into the system <clears throat> that if we want to avoid two degrees C of warming, then we got to do something about it. So why are we talking specifically about two degrees C of warming? The reason is because when you get to about 2 degrees C of warming, thereabouts, between 1.5 and 2 or 2.5, right? These are all just kind of random numbers. Um, you get to what we call, in the climate community, catastrophic warming. 
Catastrophic warming is uh, a level of warming that would push Earth's natural systems into a range that we are unequipped to really adapt to on a large scale without significant um, death, hardship, and economic uh, failure. So should we get two degrees of warming or, or thereabouts, uh, that would have catastrophic effects on Earth, on people living on Earth, and on like our economy and stuff. I've seen numbers floating around that this level of warming could reduce like gross domestic products by 20 or 30 percent by the end of the century, which in and of itself honestly isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, I think unmitigated growth is is really problematic. Um, I'm not a capitalist, so. Uh, but unless we have another system in place, this will be catastrophic for a lot of people on the planet. Um, so I've got two videos, which I want to show. Um, so I'm going to pull those up. They are um, two PBS videos kind of about, about this. Let me see here. So the first one is this one. Okay. Let me share my screen again. Before we talk about your investments, what's new? Audrey's expecting. Twins. We'd be closer to the twins. Change in plans. At Fidelity, a change in plans is always part of the plan. As we reported earlier, the inter... Okay, sorry, one second. As we reported earlier, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is a consortium of climate scientists, announced today that if the world community doesn't reduce carbon emissions drastically, millions of people across the planet will suffer dire... consequences. But as William Brangham reports, heeding that warning now is a daunting challenge. The UN's latest report, put together by over 90 authors and editors from over 40 countries, is probably the starkest, most dire warning yet about the severity of climate change and the cost of inaction. The report says that unless the world immediately begins reducing the burning of coal and oil and gas that drive up global temperatures, the world will suffer tremendous consequences. By as early as 2040, just 22 years from now, the UN says global food supplies will be threatened by increasing droughts and heat waves. Low-lying nations could be flooded by rising sea levels, potentially triggering huge flows of refugees. Fierce storms and wildfires will grow in intensity, costing billions in damages and lives lost. To keep even more drastic impacts at bay, the UN report urges the governments of the world to cut their carbon emissions enough to limit global warming to just one and a half degrees Celsius. That's about 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit above pre-industrial levels. But that would take a near revolutionary change in how the industrialized world creates electricity, grows food, and moves people and goods around. The UN acknowledges that, quote, there is no documented historic precedent for the changes needed to prevent even worse disasters from coming. As I mentioned, today's report is to date one of the strongest calls to action. And with me are two people who have spent their lives studying climate change and our responses to it. 
Rafe Pomerantz is a senior policy fellow at the Woods Hole Research Center and chairman of Arctic 21, a network of scientists working to draw attention to the effects of warming on the Arctic. And Gavin Schmidt is a climatologist and chief of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies. He's co-founder also of the climate science blog, Real Climate. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to you both. Thank you. Gavin Schmidt, to you first. Uh, this report from the UN is, to my reading, an incredibly stark warning. How do you read it? Basically, this report is telling us things that scientists have known for a long time, that climate change is already occurring, and it really doesn't take very much more for it to become a very, very serious issue, uh, not just for coastal environments, but for agriculture, for the Arctic, uh, for many, many different aspects of the planet. And this report is saying, well, you know, if we want to limit this, if we want it to not get out of control, uh, we need to act very, very quickly uh, in order to do that. And the time for doing so is running out. Rafe Pomerantz, you have spent decades acting as a bit of a Paul Revere, trying to get the country to recognize these threats. And many of our viewers may know you from that very wonderful deep dive that the New York Times did about our, our dawning of our understanding of climate policy. Looking at this report, do you think that this will finally be the thing that moves the needle? I think this report's really important. The amount of attention it's gotten has been huge. It deserves it. I see each report that comes out as incremental, adding to public understanding, building political will. I don't think there's a report, a single report, that makes all the difference. So uh, yes, it's important. It adds the momentum. But it, it, in and of itself, it's, it's part of a sequence of of uh, events. Gavin Schmidt, let's just say that world leaders decide that they do want to try to keep warming somewhere near this 1.5 degrees Celsius mark. Right. What, how serious, uh, how severe do the emissions cuts have to be? What do we have to do? So the challenge ahead of us, uh, regardless of where, what temperature we're going to end up at, uh, are that we need to reduce carbon emissions uh, by about 70 percent just to keep carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere. 70 percent. And we need to reduce it even more, even more to uh, keep the temperature constant. And basically, these temperature targets, 1.52, 2.53, uh, they depend, what, what's going to happen depends on how long it takes us to get to that point. So these are very, very large shifts in how we produce energy, how we transport ourselves, how we grow our food. And it can't be done overnight. There's a lot of uh, inertia in the system, uh, not just in the, in the physical system, but also in the economy, in, uh, in innovation, in, in systems uh, that need to evolve fast in order to get us down to those levels. Rafe, let's just say world leaders do come to you. I know you've been knocking on their doors for decades, and they say, we've seen the light, we want to enact these changes. What kinds of things, what are the top things you would like them to address? Well, first, just let me say, the prerequisite is political will. For a world leader to ask the question, they have to have the desire to do that. And unfortunately, this moment in the United States is one of our worst. Our leader says that this problem is a hoax. So. It, He's taking us out of the negotiations, et cetera. Given your assumption that world leaders want to step up, there are four areas they have to work in. Number one is R&D, research and development, innovation. We need cheap substitutes. We can do that. We're spending some money, but we, this ought to be a much higher priority on the national scene. We have an agency that's supposed to come up with radical solutions, changes. It's funded at 200, 300 million a year. The Pentagon's agency that does the same thing for the military is at $5 billion. So this has to be a much bigger priority. Number two, we need to control the other greenhouse gases, uh, like uh, methane, nitrous oxide. And where we can, which is mostly carbon in the energy system, we ought to be pricing it. The tax is the most efficient mechanism we have. It needs not only to be, exist in the United States, it has to exist globally. We can do that if we lead. Without the United States, nothing happens. The U.S. Congress is the most important body I still maintain in the world on this. And the reason is they won't act. And if they won't act, our negotiators can't move. Now, number three is decarbonization. We know how to do that through uh, biological systems like growing forests, improving soil management, and so on. 
That takes some carbon out. Then there's a whole series of technologies that have been proposed to remove carbon. They're in the early stages. You have to lower the costs, uh, lower the environmental impact, but that's another part of the R&D. And finally, which this report uh, excludes is solar radiation management. I call it a Penetubo strategy. It's where you put particles in the stratosphere to reflect sunlight. It's a kind of a pretty no, dramatic geoengineering. Geo, dramatic geoengineering, but we have to understand whether there's a tool there. We have no research program right now. We can't tell anybody what the risks are, what how clear the benefits are. We just know that it works in the natural world. Gavin Schmidt, you hear Rafe is talking about a lot of possible solutions, but also rightly signaling that there really hasn't been the political will thus far to do this. Do you have any reason to hope that we will change course? There's a lot of political will elsewhere in the world and at the local and, federal and state levels, even here in the U.S. Uh, I, I, I find myself talking to people who are involved in local and regional uh, and, uh, and national, but perhaps not federal level uh, efforts that are, that are really bearing fruit. And so I think that uh, this notion that everything res, uh, rests on Congress uh, to fix, I think they have a, a role to play, but there's a lot of movement going on elsewhere in the world, uh, in Europe and in China and Japan. Uh, there's a lot of new things moving along there. So I'm not totally uh, in despair. But the key thing to remember from this report is that it's clear that the best time to have reduced emissions was 25 years ago. But the second best time to reduce emissions <laughs> is right now. Do you have that optimism? Are you in despair yet? Well, uh, I, that's not where I go, despair. Uh, it may be warranted, but I don't go there. I just ask uh, this as someone who has been pushing this rock yeah, up the hill for so long. Right. Well, what we're seeing now is, which we didn't see 40 years ago, is we're seeing climate change impacts in the rearview mirror. In other words, everything was sort of projected back there. It was in the, it was in coming, but we didn't really see it wasn't visible. Now we see that it's happened. I'll give you two examples. Most of the coral reefs in the world now are dead because the ocean is warm sufficiently to bleach them. Secondly, the Arctic is unraveling. That will begin to emerge as a major source of emissions if we don't halt the warming. Then it gets more out of control. So future generations face huge challenges. We are in this. We have to manage it over the long run. The sooner we get at it, the better. All right. Rafe Pomerantz, Gavin Schmidt, thank you both very much. Okay, sorry, I don't know why the sound is not working. Let me um, see what I can do here. Was anybody able to hear it? Okay, that's weird. Um, huh. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what happened. <laughs> anyway, it's a cool video. Um, I'll post it um, for those of you that couldn't hear it for whatever reason. Um, but you'll know if uh, if you were reading along with the captions or if you could hear it, you'll notice that that he mentioned geoengineering um, in there. So it's not like a weird thing that no one is talking about. It is something that people are talking about as a response to to climate change and um, and so I think it's getting real like um, it's getting lots of bites from from um, from serious people if we want to call it that uh, okay back to sharing so catastrophic warming then two degrees C. We've talked about this quite a bit, right? But just to reiterate, two degrees C of temperature rise puts us somewhere in here, this region, okay? Um, so kind of right at the sort of uh, upper limit of the lower-ish scenario. Um, 
that's the RCP 4.5, that's the Paris Agreement. So if we can somehow meet the Paris Agreement, which essentially starts scaling down emissions beginning in like 2040, 2050, um, back down to sort of below 1990 levels or so, then we can probably keep warming to two degrees C or below. Um, I also included this little figure in here. I love this figure. Um, in case there was any question whatsoever uh, that um, climate change was, was caused by humans, um, this is showing the, the black line here is the actually observed global temperatures. Okay, it's the same in all of these figures. In the top figure here, the yellow lines and, the, and the, all these other lines are what the temperature would be assuming that the only thing influencing it was all of these different factors. So volcanic eruptions, the sun, uh, changes in Earth's orbit, aerosols, land cover, uh, greenhouse gases. And so they've, they've been categorized into natural drivers and human drivers. So absent any humans, this is what the temperature of Earth would be for the last 130 or so years. So you can see that it doesn't match the observations at all. If you include the human component, uh, this is what it looks like, this red line. So it matches pretty well. Um, there are some issues with it, it's not perfect, but if you put them all together and you run it in a climate model, you get this orange line, which is human plus natural variability, mainly volcanic eruptions. And you can see that when you do that, especially beginning in 1960 on, it really does match the temperature record very well. So it's caused by us and we're heading for right around that two degrees C mark um, by the end of the the end of the century. You can see how that translates to sea level rise, which we talked about quite significantly. So if we hit that medium to low um, uh, mark, then we'll see about one meter or so um, rise in global sea level, so about three feet. Um, if we have much worse warming, then we'll see more sea level rise. The thing about sea level rise is that it doesn't stop in 2100. It keeps going for a long time before it stabilizes. So these are not final numbers. These are just in the year 2100. Catastrophic warming also means more of these actual types of catastrophes that we often consider catastrophes like stronger hurricanes, um, more rain from the hurricanes that are currently exist, right? So you have a hurricane, you have climate change on top of it, and you get an even rainier and even worse hurricane. We're also getting melting glaciers, right? And this process is accelerating as these glaciers melt back up the mountains. Um, we're losing this fresh water that's locked up in ice. It's eventually going to run into streams, into rivers, and then into the ocean over time. So that's fresh water that we're losing faster. So not only is it there a warming implication, um, but it's also changing the ecosystems and our availability of fresh water. The Arctic is mentioned as a hotspot for this catastrophic climate change. The collapse of the Arctic is a real problem. So the projected change in near surface temperature at the end of the century, so for the 2080s, um, under this medium to low scenario, so two degrees C of warming, still shows up to 11 degrees C of warming in parts of the Arctic region, especially over Svalbard, which is right here, um, north of kind of Scandinavia. So Svalbard could experience 10, 11 degrees C of warming by the 2080s, even under the two degrees C global warming, okay? Um, and most of that warming is likely to occur during the cold season, so during winter, which is when Arctic sea ice forms. So if you, if you change the temperature in the winter and you raise it up by 10 degrees C of warming, you're going to get significantly less ice growth 
in the winter Arctic ice, which is going to cause big problems um, in the summer. So not only is there that Arctic ice feedback with a change in albedo, but as you um, reveal more land in the Arctic, um, one of the real catastrophes that nobody has a clear idea on how it's going to play out is the thawing of the permafrost. So permafrost is permanently frozen soil. Um, you can see here where most of the permafrost is located. It's located in Siberia, Western Canada and Alaska, parts of Greenland and Scandinavia as well, but in general kind of right in this area. And so the dark blue is continuous permafrost and then the lighter blue is discontinuous uh, permafrost. The um, green is thermocarst or peat forest, as we might call it. Um, so there's quite a lot of permafrost. And as the Arctic warms up, especially if it warms up 10 degrees, um, you're going to see uh, incredible thawing of the permafrost, which is going to have a number of really devastating effects. It could cause um, rock falls and landslides. It can cause increased release of carbon dioxide and methane from what we call methane clathrates, which are, lo which are locked up in the permafrost. Um, you can have lake and wetland drainage, right, from now newly thawed ponds and lakes on the surface. Um, loss of cultural artifacts, a building collapse, um, and coastal erosion, and other sorts of things that would precipitate um, kind of a, a, a domino effect uh, in the Arctic. So the Arctic is really um, a problem. Yeah, Leroy, what's up? Um, I also heard that there are potentially ancient viruses. Oh, wait, that was the next slide, wasn't it? <laughs> OK. Yeah, well, you, mind, always just... have a, you always have a good way of like knowing where my brain is going. <laughs> <laughs> OK, sorry, thanks. Yeah, so Leroy is right. There are locked in this ice and permafrost and um, glaciers and ice caps ancient viruses um, which uh, are being released to the atmosphere every day, hundreds of them. Um, most of them are not going to affect us because they, they probably, you know, for whatever reason, um, are unable of, of impacting like human cells, but, or they're not going to survive very long once they're like unthawed, but um, with the rate of ice melt and the rate of thawing of the permafrost, the release of these viruses um, is, yeah, creating the potential for a new pathogen like the coronavirus pathogen that caused the pandemic the past year and a half to happen again. Um, so. This is a very scary headline. Um, it gives me like anxiety just reading it, but I, I do need to say that the while the coronavirus pandemic this year hasn't been explicitly linked to climate change, the likelihood of another climate change driven pandemic, and that's not to say that COVID um, wasn't caused by climate change. We don't know, we don't actually know, and it's very possible that climate change could have been driving a lot of the pandemic the past year. But um, as climate change worsens, the likelihood of another pandemic or a disease outbreak as a result of climate change is increasing, Oops. is increasing. Um, so don't put away your masks yet. <laughs> um, even once this is over, because it's likely that we may have to adjust the way we live um, to accommodate um, a potential increase in uh, wild viruses that can that can cause uh, that can affect humans. Wasn't there also going to be like a well, not like a rerun, but like the I think bubonic plague or Spanish flu or some certain things that happen like a long time ago that were buried are also going to come back again because of the melting of the permafrost? Um, yes. So I think sort of. What, I think what you're referring to, so the bubonic plague is actually still exists. Um, it's a bacteria and actually you can treat it with penicillin, um, which is interesting. 
um, yeah, so people still actually get the plague and it's like a bacterial infection. Um, and then they receive antibiotics and survive. Um, which is crazy, right? Because like the bubonic plague like wiped out um, more humans in one like sort of pandemic type thing than any other. But I think what you're talking about is they recently found um, an, an elk that was frozen, an elk carcass that was frozen in the permafrost that contained the smallpox virus. Um, and the smallpox virus was eradicated. It's actually the only virus in the history of humanity that we've eradicated entirely um, from the surface of the earth. Um, the only one. And um, yeah, <laughs> so if the permafrost melts and there are smallpox viruses that are locked in these dead animal carcasses um, and they manage to survive and are released to the atmosphere, that's a huge problem. Smallpox is um, really devastating to humans. And because it's um, gone, we none of us are vaccinated against it. Um, it's, it's like, uh, well, maybe some older people are, but uh, most people are not. Um, vaccinated against smallpox because it's gone. So um, that's the thing, right? Like you don't have to keep getting vaccinated against something if it's gone. But yeah, I think what you're referring to is that story that came out like a year or two ago. It was like 2017 or something. Yeah, exactly. So that's scary. Um, and in addition to smallpox, there are also like plenty of flu and coronaviruses um, in the ice, in dead animals, in permafrost, that if the release of air could mutate in a bat, for example, or a bird, for example, and unleash another pandemic. So I actually, um, moment of truth, am, uh, I, I think that um, the real kind of devastating impact of climate change is actually going to be a climate change driven viral pandemic. Um, I think that this past year was a warning um, and a test and we failed. So I'm scared, <laughs> um, really scared actually. I was always scared um, and uh, I feel bad about joking about it before but I was like a virus is what's gonna wipe us out and I still think that's the case but now I'm like really scared that it's for real because of the way that we responded to this virus the past year. Um, not to scare everyone, um, I think maybe we learned some lessons and um, maybe not, I don't know. We got back vaccines really quickly. Um, so that's good because the mRNA vaccines um, are like really good and we can they're kind of like plug and play so you can plug in different rna mrnas now as long as there are coronavirus um so that's cool um but still uh it's kind of it's eye-opening i think i don't think there's like cause for concern at this like exact moment but um yeah so <laughs> Spencer's saying, tell that to Florida. Yeah, I know. My parents live in Florida, actually. They just moved there. I'm like, why? But, you know, it's whatever. No offense to anyone who's from Florida. but um, And, yeah, we would have we been, um, Caroline's saying we would have been fine if Trump didn't get rid of the pandemic response. That is true to an extent. However, um, there's some good articles that even Europe really failed the coronavirus test and that a lot of people are hypothesizing that... Um, the West or like the global North um, failed because we're obsessed with capitalism. And, um, you know, the way that, for example, the Chinese uh, ha government handled uh, the pandemic is very different than the way we did. Um, and they've had like, they haven't had a case in, I mean, they had like five cases yesterday or something, right? We had like 55,000 despite like 35% of adults being vaccinated already. So um, I do think Trump was a problem. Um, however, I think that probably a big, big problem is just we're like obsessed with capitalism. And that's also why we have climate change, um, you know, so 
Um, yeah. Anyway, Leroy, I feel like you were raising your hand or something. Um, yeah, I, I was going to very, I'm kind of already spacing out on what I was thinking. I think it was actually something akin to what uh, Caroline was bringing up that, that, um, that, um, I mean, not that, that Biden is ideal, but I do think that like, at least for our country in particular, which is a narrow-minded perspective, because obviously it's a global problem. It's like, I think I, like one of the first thoughts I had was like, oh, like ideally we wouldn't be under another administration like Trump's administration, because that was just like unimaginably horrific. Mm -hmm. But like at the same time, it might not be substantially better, even if we're in like a slightly better administration, like a sort of like still strongly capitalist oriented administration, which is probably what we're going to be under, um, then it might not be, it, it will be better probably, but it probably won't be like the better that we really need, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah, totally. I think like, I think about Europe too, where Europe like, you know, got hit and um, had two waves, uh, three waves now, I guess, and like, uh, you know, similar to the U.S., but because they had more leadership and, and stuff, they last summer went, looked very different for them than this, than our summer last summer, for example. So, um, and they've had, you know, per capita, I think, um, less deaths, deaths than we have. Um, but we'll see. I, I feel like, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's just funny because when I um, made this presentation, it, well, the last time I taught this class was last spring um, at the beginning of the pandemic. And then the whole summer went by and the whole winter and now I'm teaching it again and still talking about this. And it feels even scarier now in the rear view mirror that it's like lasted so long um but hopefully um what this has done is it's taught us uh some lessons um and despite leadership and all of that hopefully we change the way that we kind of um think about our relationship with these small viruses as humans like we're not infallible and um the thing that is actually the most threatening to humanity's survival is a virus. And one of the, yeah, the biggest problems is these new viruses that are being um, released from uh, from the permafrost and, and stuff, you know, and also um, the spread of potentially tropical pathogens like Ebola and malaria and other things like that. Um, further northward as northern areas warm up. For example, North Carolina has cases of malaria now because um, it's so much warmer. Um, so, yeah, cool. Okay, I only have a couple more slides left. Um, I promise not to be so sad. Um, so, so um, one of the ways that uh, we can think about climate change is in the carbon cycle, right? And then in, in the cycling of carbon through through the environment, through um, our own emissions and trees and uh, and animals and and all different sorts of um, things. And and I know we we talked about this a little bit, but if we had allowed or if all of the emissions that we had emitted had accumulated in the atmosphere, our concentration of carbon dioxide would be about um, you know, 40% higher than it is currently um, or so. So a lot of that carbon has been taken out of the atmosphere by extra trees growing and the ocean overcompensating for our folly by taking out more carbon. So we end up with a concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that's lower actually than if you were to just add up all the coal, oil, gas, cement, and deforestation that we've done over the past 150, 250 years. So the land and the ocean are overcompensating for our mistakes. And so um, I'll return to that in a second. 
I did also just want to say, like, make one note, right, that we're not going to run out of fossil fuels in time. So don't pin your hopes on us just running out of coal or gas or oil, and then that will solve the climate change problem. That's not going to happen. And so it's in that context that geoengineering arises. And geoengineering is divided into two categories. You have the carbon sequestration category, which is dealing with the carbon cycle side of things. Planting more trees, injecting carbon dioxide from the atmosphere back into the ground. And we're going to talk about all of this in, in detail. And then more broadly, um, the other kind of techniques are called solar radiation management. So you have solar radiation management and carbon dioxide removal or carbon removal or carbon sequestration. So you have the carbon side of things and then you have the solar radiation management side of things. And so I'll just end with this slide. No geoengineering method can provide an easy or readily acceptable alternative solution to the problem of climate change and the best way to limit the impacts of climate change is to immediately reduce carbon emissions. So I am not in support of geoengineering. Let's make that clear. Um, geoengineering of the Earth's climate is very likely to be technically possible. However, the technology to do so is barely formed. There are major uncertainties regarding its effectiveness, costs, and environmental impacts. Methods that act rapidly by reflecting sunlight may be relatively ineffective over the long run. Methods that act by removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere involve fewer uncertainties and risks, but would have a much slower effect on global temperature. So there are trade-offs. And so these are the two methods. And there are some videos here, which I'm not going to show this time because I want to try and fix my, um, my um, screen sharing, video sharing things. But... Um, yeah, generally, let's see. Was I just not sharing my screen for all of that, LOL? Or was I sharing my screen? I went for it. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, that's that's my little intro to geoengineering. There's obviously like, I'm sure, you know, there's tons of, you know, questions and stuff that people have they, that they want to ask. Um, and so we're going to go through all of it in detail. Um, we're going to talk about solar radiation management next week as kind of an introduction. And then we're going to talk about, I'll sh actually, I'll share my screen to, to show the syllabus. Um, and then we're going to talk about Mount Pinatubo and volcanic eruptions as an ana analog to solar radiation management. So the reason why people have proposed solar radiation management is because volcanoes erupt and they do kind of the same thing. And so we can see what happens when big volcanoes like Mount Pinatubo erupt and then infer what would happen if we just kind of did that on our own. I think someone even asked me last week if we could make volcanoes erupt more, um, which we cannot do. Um, and then we'll talk about the carbon budget. We'll review the carbon budget and specificity. And then we'll talk about carbon sequestration and carbon capture and storage. We'll talk about some of the ethical... Um, problems related to geoengineering and the political problems related to geoengineering and then um, specifically I want to talk about films like Geostorm and Snowpiercer and other good object depictions of geoengineering um, to see if um, you know we might be able to address this um, this issue uh, in other ways so, and then for your final projects, um, I'm going to ask you to do a more in-depth research on any of the geoengineering techniques that were presented in class or not. Um, and the details on that I'll come out with in a second, uh, or not in a second, in, in like um, later this week or soon. Um, and that will be due like mid-May or something, end of May. Um, and I'll, get, I'll have details about that. I'm just in my office looking at some of my projects and I remember one of my students made these like white roof tiles as part of this project a couple years ago. So that was cool. Um, so I'll give you like details on that. But um, yeah, so that's what's to come.
So get excited. Get real excited. <laughs> get pumped! Um, all right. Any questions for me? We feeling good? We feeling Just, happy? Oh, okay. side note, we submit the um, midterm just on canvas yeah okay yeah you can submit it on canvas or if you printed it out and um want to leave it in my box you can do that too my mailbox it's on the sixth floor of mclean 613 was it hard to find leroy it's pretty easy right it's fairly simple yeah um, i had to ask around a little bit but i did figure it out you get off the elevators and you kind of walk straight Mm -hmm. Yeah, in that hallway. And then my life, it's alphabetical. Okay, um, on that note, then I will see you all next week. Um, enjoy the nice spring weather. Can we chat about the midterm for a second? Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Okay, I don't I don't really care if they hear. Um, I'm just kind of wondering uh, the what I'm doing is I'm kind of can I share my screen with you? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, let me. Um, yeah, go ahead. All right. So what I'm doing um, I'm compiling the text right now is I'm making a little booklet about like um, ice melt and like. Uh, basically the growing the growing blue area, I guess. And so this little blue dot uh, grows over the whole course of the book and eventually it pushes out all the text mm -hmm. out of the sides. So I'm just kind of wondering um, what kind of content, um, how deep in depth the content needs, like wants to be because I'm sort of trying to gauge how many pages I need to have and stuff like that. I mean, it looks like you have a lot of content there. Without oh. being able to read it, I'm, I would guess that this is enough content. Um, okay. But I don't, you know, I, I guess I just want you to demonstrate that you really understand what you're talking about. That you know, like the thing you've brought up is really clear to me and I know like where, what your position on it is and stuff. If that makes okay, sense. Cool. Yeah. All right. That looks like fine to me. You don't have to like write a whole essay, you know? Um, okay. Because I was just, I was just wondering about like how much extra research outside of what we talked about in class you want um, and stuff like that. So. Yeah. I think, you know, I want like three references about, I think that, is that what it says on there? Maybe not. It um, doesn't say anything about any references. But like my class notes can be references. So okay. if, I think I'm shooting for like, you know, that kind of range. It doesn't have to be like an in-depth. It's not going to be like our final project, which will be more um, research-based. This is more just like demonstrating knowledge retention and stuff. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds Bye -bye. good. Okay. See you.